Hey everybody, welcome to Merlin Comedy, and please welcome your illustrious host, Greg Johnson, and laugh a lot, please. What's up everybody, give yourselves a round of applause, thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's a Thursday night show, we do this every Thursday, Friendly Faces, thank you guys for being here, everyone. Everyone, for those who can't see in back, Jay-Z and Beyonce are up here in the front. I love the sound guy, he gets to listen to cans the whole time. That's what, the, 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 you, call, uh, you call headphones cans. <laughs> no better time to do my impression of, uh, I want to do an impression for you guys. Uh, this is my impression of Keanu Reeves. This is my impression of Keanu Reeves in the movie Speed. This is my impression of Keanu Reeves at a pivotal point during the 90s action movie, Speed. Cans. Cans. They were just cans. For those of you who may not know the movie Speed as well as I do, there's a bomb, Dennis Hoffman puts a bomb on a bus and they have to keep it above 50 miles an hour or else the whole thing's gonna explode. Sandra Bullock somehow ends up driving the bus, and she's like, oh, get out of the way, get out of the way. And uh, there's this woman with a baby stroller going out across the crosswalk, she's like, oh, get out of the way, get out of the way. And she hits the baby stroller, and she's like, oh my god, I killed the baby, I killed the baby. But for some reason, the baby stroller is just full of cans. <laughs> and empty cans go out all over the streets. And luckily, Keanu Reeves sees that, and he's able to appease her by being like, cans. <laughs> cans. They were just cans. He won the Oscar. Good night. I'm gonna make this seem like, have you ever seen Laugh Therapy? They have that in New York City. They're like, oh, it's good to laugh, so we just get together, and everyone's like. <laughs> it's like a psychopath convention. That is not the way to do it, but I do hope that you guys laugh heartily so that we could air this sometimes and we can all. Uh, buy those condos in Las Vegas. What do you say, guys? Come on, give it up for yourselves, huh? Thank you very much. bring up this comedian now. I'm very happy to have him here. We met in Boston back when we were both teenagers. Uh, since then, he's been on The Late Show with David Letterman, so he's done very well for himself. I love this guy. He's a very funny guy. Please give a big round of applause for Joe List. Thanks for being here, Joe. Thanks, buddy. Greg, everybody. Greg Johnson. We were teenagers. That's fun. We were, uh, we were teens. I did, and I did that Edamame gig last year. Yeah. That was fun. They asked me to do it this year, but I was out of town. So, uh, <laughs> you're welcome, buddy. <laughs> and then, uh, also, they just aired it in uh, England, so I got a check for like 200 bucks. Uh, 243. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we dressed as a bean. And then I danced around. Uh, I was going to talk about how embarrassing it is, but Greg did it yesterday. So, I feel bad. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Boy, a lot of... A lot of Girls, this is great. This is exciting. This is uh, cool. I, I, I was here and there was no one here, and I went to get a, a smoothie, and I came back and everyone's here. Nice to see everybody. It wasn't. It was green. I'm, not, I'm pointing at it, but it's not here. But I did just have a green beverage, so I feel pretty healthy. I have jokes. I will get into them. In Brooklyn, you're supposed to riff and act like you're like ah, you know. Uh, so I was trying to do that, but. Uh, <laughs> some, some places you gotta just come hard with the jokes, but in Brooklyn you really gotta be like, hey, it was wood, and uh, I drank a green thing, and uh, but, uh, so I'll just get, oh, oh my god, the girl is so pretty, can you tell girls they're pretty? I don't even know anything. I told the girl she was pretty the other day, she got mad at me. She was like, I don't need you to validate me. I was like, oh, Jesus, she's trying to be nice. 
I didn't mean to imply that you're a mall parking garage ticket. I, uh... It's like, if it makes you feel any better, I only think you're pretty on the outside now. You seem like a very unpleasant human being to me. I feel bad. I don't know. I don't want to offend anybody. Either. So now I, don't, I, don't, I try not to, I don't compliment girls anymore. I just, I kind of look at them from afar and I, I appreciate that, you know? Checking out girls, I guess is what you would call it. But girls check out guys, guys check out girls, we all do it. You ever get caught checking out a girl with your girlfriend and not because she sees you, but because you elbow her thinking she's one of your buddies? <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. I saw my girlfriend, I was with my girlfriend the other day, I'm like, hey, check out that ugly woman over there, I hate that girl. <laughs> thought you were Phil, sorry about that. <laughs> I tried to save it. I thought all guys checked out girls, but I guess not. I was with my buddy the other day, I was like, check out that girl, and he goes, why? I don't know. I thought that was a thing we were doing. I'm sorry. Nobody's ever asked me before. My uncle said it to me when I was five. I just went with it for the rest of my life. I guess I don't know why. I thought pretty girls were like deer and sunsets. You just point them out if you see one, you know? Oh, there's a deer. How about that sunset? One time I saw a pretty girl riding a deer into a sunset, and I was like, holy shit, this is huge. Everyone's going to check this out. I was on mushrooms. It might not have been that. I might have saw something else. Anyways, my girlfriend's sweet. We were talking about the, uh, sometimes she's a little naive, though. Uh, we were talking about the obesity epidemic here in America, and uh, we're just like a big deal, I guess. Everyone's fat or something, I guess. I don't know. I don't think it's that big of a deal. As long as our army is not fat, who gives a shit? You know what I mean? They have to, like, fight, I guess. But even that, it's just, it seems pretty remote. You just launch, you can be fat doing that as well. Fuck it. Fat. Let's get fat. You know? I guess the healthcare system, I don't know. My girlfriend's naive though, she was talking about the, uh, we were talking about the obesity epidemic, she goes, I don't think it's that big of a deal because eventually you just seem to lose weight because you never see elderly people that are overweight. <laughs> uh, boy, that's, that's a hell of a theory. Um, you never want to be the guy that pokes holes in somebody's theory, but uh, I felt bad. I was like, yeah, those people are dead. Um, their hearts failed because they were too fat. That's, that's why it's an epidemic. That's the epidemic part of this equation. If it weren't for all the death, it would be an uh, obesity festival that we were involved in. You know? Yeah, evidently you recover from getting shot in the face at some point in your old age as well. You don't see a lot of elderly people with gunshot wounds to the face. That seems to heal up at some point. Anyways. The other day, I'm very, I'm very sweet to my girlfriend. Very, it's very easy to be, uh, like a, if you want to be like a sweet guy, what you do is you always, treat the girl, always treat her like she just finished crying. Because that's why people are the nicest to people. You know what I mean? Like after like, uh, a, a girl's crying, you're always like, you're going to be great, and you're, you're fine, and I love you. Kids too, if like a kid is crying afterwards, like you want to get ice cream. <laughs> Guys, we get kind of screwed though when it comes to the, the post-crying. People are nice to us while we're crying. Then as soon as you're done, people are like, dude, what is up? That was insane. Get it together, Jesus. We, uh, we have sex. That's fun. Um, we've been doing it a long time, but we still have sex. We mix it up, I think. We keep it fresh, you know what I mean? It's important to do that. Like, sometimes she'll be on top, and sometimes I won't cry. Stuff like that, you know? It's, uh, I've been trying to talk dirty recently to kind of uh, spice it up sexually, but I'm not good at talking dirty. I think because I didn't get laid enough growing up. To prop I'm too grateful for the girl. <laughs> it's hard to be grateful and dirty at the same time, you know? I, I try, I'm like, yeah, I, I really appreciate this. This is huge. <laughs> this is a big goal of mine for a really long time. And, uh, I kind of treat the girl like she's helping me move. I'm like, thanks for volunteering your time. I know it's sad. <laughs> then I try to save it. I'm like, who's your daddy? I want to thank him too. He did a hell of a job raising me. I didn't get laid. I got laid when I was single, but like not with any skill or anything. I was never like a get laid guy. Like it would happen, but I never knew how. Like you ever like uh, play a video game, you don't know how to play it, so you just hit all the buttons and occasionally you do like some crazy finishing move and you're like, oh shit. That's how I got laid. My friends are like, how did you do that? I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like, come on, just tell us. I'm like, I really don't know. I'm... All right, decent analogy, not that funny, but. Uh... <laughs> I have a friend, he thought that I got laid with skill, I guess. I don't know, he's like a, he's kind of a douche guy. We went to uh, Las Vegas together for like four days, and he set up like a sex contest with a point system. He's like, dude, what happens in Vegas stays in, he did that bullshit, which is embarrassing. 
And then he was like, any girl we have sex with in college, that's 10 points. He's like, a girl over 50, that's another 10 points. And I was like, just, I'll go ahead and stop you. Just put me down for zero. You can throw me down for zero for the weekend. I'm not gonna get laid. If I get laid, I win. That's the only contest. There's no points. I'm the winner. She probably loses, but I win. And uh, I like having sex in a relationship, though, because you get an idea. You, you kind of know what's going on. You can make a request, but basically it's kind of, you get it, you know. When you're single, it's like a surprise. It's like a weird, it could be dangerous. One time I had sex with a woman, she seemed pretty normal, but then uh, when we started to have sex, she got really aggressive with me. She was, kind of, she was up top. She was just bouncing wildly. Like, like there was no rhythm at all. Just like a herky-jerky... <laughs> bouncing thing, and it wasn't, it was like she was riding a bike with a flat tire, I didn't know why she was making this, I wasn't even like in her, my penis was in me, it was like fucking back off, this is crazy, get inside everybody, we gotta retreat here, I thought she was having a seizure, I was like, do you need a spoon to bite on, I saw this in a movie, like I have one in my kitchen, and then uh, she got even more aggressive, she started shoving my shoulders into the bed really hard, and then she started calling me a nerd, <laughs> He's like, yeah, you nerd. You like that, you fucking nerd? <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> You're hurting my shoulders. Uh, and my feelings, also. So. Also, I'm not really a nerd. I just have bad eyesight. You're being a little judgmental right now. I have glasses, but I'm a very good athlete, and I'm bad at math, and I hate sci-fi. So. Also, I'm getting laid right now. That's not very nerdy, is it? And, uh, and then she got, like, she took it up a notch. She was like, shut up, you bitch. And she started choking me. I got into uh, the choking scene. And I'm not here to uh, judge if you guys are into choking each other sexually. You know, do it, whatever. With permission, you know. You can't choke the first time you have sex with somebody. I don't know you. You may be murdering me. I have no idea what you're doing. You know? We didn't go over a safe for it, so I was trying to guess. So I was like, chocolate chips, Advil, pennies. Please get off of me. I have horrible anxiety, that's why I'm trying to lean on this. Is, is that a cool look? <laughs> Does this look comfy? You ever gonna put your foot up on something to look cool and then you realize it's a much higher surface than you thought it was? I was at a bar one time talking to a girl, I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> that looked a lot lower when I started. <laughs> you can't panic, you have to go with it. I'm like, I just think I want to see my balls through my jeans. <laughs> I was at uh, Starbucks the other day, and uh, I know, I'm uh, you know, I'm sure you guys are mad at me here for going to Starbucks. It's a pretty hip neighborhood. <laughs> I was at uh, Starbucks, and the, uh, the barista girl, she was singing behind the counter. She was just singing, she didn't know I was there, she was singing out loud. And, uh, then she saw me, and she was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. She was like, embarrassed, and I was like, that's alright, I was enjoying it. And then she goes, ew, that's creepy. <laughs> Boy, you really turned the tables on me here. I thought this was your embarrassing moment. And I'm a creep. I don't really think that's fair. Uh, I'm not really creepy. I'm not even enjoying your singing at all. I was full of shit. I was trying to be nice. I felt bad that you felt weird. Creepy would be if you turned around and I was shirtless licking the cash register. That would be creepy. I'm thoughtful. I, uh, I said I liked your singing. I didn't say it from underneath your bed, you know. I don't mind being called creepy, but I want to earn it if I get called creepy, you know? If we walk in, like, I got a large coffee. Can I also smell your feet at the end of your shift? <laughs> That's creepy. I'm like, you're right. And they're all getting to me. I'll just take the coffee. <laughs> well, that was going to be my big closer there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like one, 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 one creepy punchline too many, I guess. Oh, let me tell you, uh, this is a thing that happened. Um, I was talking to my buddy. I don't have any kids. My girlfriend and I, we go, we're not going to have kids, I don't think. We like them, but uh, I don't. It seems like too much work. My buddy was like, you should have a kid. He's like, you'd be a good dad, which is a nice compliment. But just because you might be good at something doesn't mean you necessarily want to do that thing. You know? Like, I'd probably be unbelievably good at pleasuring a man sexually, but it doesn't seem enjoyable to me, personally. So I'm not going to do it. I'm grateful that people raise kids, and I'm grateful that people pleasure men sexually. I've been the benefactor of both things. <laughs> From different people. Uh, I think people think I'd be a good dad because uh, I, I'm a nice guy, and I don't drink, and I like kids. But if I had a kid, it's very likely that none of those things would be true anymore. You know? 
If I had a kid, I'd probably be like, give me a drink, because I hate this kid and all of you. And so, uh, <laughs> wait, it's very hard to tell what is going to get a laugh in this room. Uh, <laughs> the joke before that one never works, and that one always works. You guys switched it on me. But, uh, anyways, it, it's been really great. I love this bar, and uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Thank you for having me. Keep it going for Joe Liss, everybody. Thanks for doing the show, Joe. Love you. I mean it. Uh, there's a few more comedians uh, here tonight, and I think you're going to love them. This next guy, be kind to him. If, uh, you know, I hate to say a guy traveled here from Boston, but you're all very nice people, and you'll support him because he traveled here from Boston. This next guy traveled here from Boston all the way to be here on our Brooklyn Comedy Show because we get the best. He's been on the BBC, he's been on the Late Late Show. Please, if you would, give him a big round of applause and welcome onto the stage, Dan Bulger. Danny! Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Greg. I came here just for this. What are you doing? Um, uh, fucking... Uh, <laughs> Greg, we're all from Boston. It's a weird show to be here. Uh, I like Boston. Boston's great. Our, our team won the Super Bowl championship. And we cheated too, which is like way cooler. It's like if Nixon ran it. We deflated a football. I don't know how that helps, but we did it. I don't know. I don't know why we did it, but I know how we did it. We used to do this cool thing in practice where Brady would go back to throw a pass, and then uh, Aaron Hernandez would stab the living shit out of it. Because that was the controversy from this year was that we deflated a football, but the one from the year before was that our Pro Bowl tight end murdered enough people that you wouldn't have been that surprised if he ate one of them. That <laughs> laughs. <laughs> We got a lot of snow. I'm sure you guys got like a dusting, right? It's melted down. Remember when you were a kid and it would snow and you're like, ah, you know, fucking. And then like even the, <laughs> even when you were an adult, like the first time it would snow, like it was pretty. Like it wasn't gorgeous, like the way Hawaii is gorgeous, but it was pretty because it was pure white and it was really fluffy. And you don't know why, but for some reason you were very attracted to it. It was like that progressive insurance lady. <laughs> But after you get like eight feet in three weeks, like I remember the last time it snowed, like I just looked up at the sky and I was like, you know what? Maybe gay people shouldn't be allowed to get married. <laughs> We've clearly upset something. <laughs> this might be a little hipstery to do gay jokes. <laughs> gay jokes are like the movie Taken, like they're really hacky, but if it's well executed, you respect it. <laughs> This room's so weird, I feel like if I don't do well, I'm gonna get like a gang initiating beating on the way out. It's like, well, I had a bad set, but I'm a porcupine now. Now, homophobia is stupid. That was like my goal for the year, as I'm trying to like stop calling things gay. Like, not like people, but like shirts and shit. Cause it's stupid. Like I got called on. I was driving a comedian friend of mine to a gig. And I was like, ah, this traffic's fucking gay. And he's like, you shouldn't say that. And I was like, yeah, but I don't mean that it's like a homosexual. And he's like, what do you mean? Oh, I just, I just hate it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'll stop saying it. No fucking. It was a pretty good winter though. I turned 29. Uh, I know. The secret is to moisturize. <laughs> But I wanted to celebrate for my birthday, right? I only get a few more of these things. And I wanted to celebrate, but it's hard for me to celebrate because I don't really drink. Uh, that's how I drink. But fucking, I don't really drink, I just smoke weed. Uh, and weed's great, but it's a very shitty celebration drug. It's like, hey, what'd you do for your birthday? Oh, I got hungry and self-conscious. <laughs> so I wanted to up the ante a little bit. I had a buddy that had some mushrooms. He's like, I'll do those fuckers. So I did those. It was the fifth time I'd ever done them. It has gone well zero times. Because <laughs> I don't know, I don't do them right. Like, you gotta do them somewhere scenic, like the desert or the rainforest. 
I did them in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, sounds like some of you travel, but for those of you who don't get out, uh, let me give you an image. Uh, here's Worcester. Uh, imagine Detroit if it was never good. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, you go to Detroit, it's like, this burned down building used to be a Ford factory. You go to Worcester, it's like, this pawn shop has always been a pawn shop. <laughs> so you start tripping, you're like, ah, oh, fuck, are those walls bleeding? And then a sober guy's like, nah, that's just urban decay. <laughs> that's my, it's the best word I know. <laughs> I'm really dumb. <laughs> I just found out recently I've been spelling the word definitely wrong my whole life. Like, I wasn't even close. Like, I was far enough up at spell check, wasn't giving me the right word to correct it with. So my whole life I've just been sending emails, like, I will defiantly be attending your mother's funeral. <laughs> Try to learn better ones. I'm just trying to get smarter in general. Uh, you know what? The best thing I've started doing is I stopped listening to comedy podcasts. Like, I used to just listen to comedy podcasts, and then I realized I know way more about road hacks than I know about Africa. <laughs> so I'm like, I listen to some smart shit. I listen to a science one. I listen to one about Charles Darwin. He was the evolution guy. Uh, I listen to that one because I say I believe in evolution, but I don't really know what the fuck it is. <laughs> Like, I saw someone on TV say so was like, she didn't believe in evolution, and she was like, if apes turn into humans one day, then how come there aren't still apes that become humans? And I was like, what a fucking idiot, but in my head I was like, yeah, why isn't that happening? <laughs> yeah. So I listened to this one about Darwin, and uh, I learned a little bit about him. You know what I learned is, uh, did you know the church didn't burn him? <laughs> I always thought they burned him. <laughs> I think I just assumed they burned him. Because they burned another guy a hundred years before because he was like, hey, the earth goes around the sun. And they were like, well, fuck, we can't not, not burn that guy. <laughs> that seems dangerous. But then Darwin like, disappeared for 10 years. He came back with like, a big mangy beard. And they're like, where are you been? And it's like, I've been on an island watching pigeons fuck for seven years. And I got bad news, there's no God. <laughs> And they didn't burn him. Uh, yeah, urban decay. That's a fancy term. It means uh, shithole. I learned it from the DVD commentary uh, to The Wire. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen The Wire, uh, you've probably met this guy. Uh, what? You haven't seen The Wire? <laughs> oh, you gotta see The Wire. <laughs> I hate those douches. Like, you gotta see The Wire, you gotta see Breaking Bad. Oh, like Mad Men. <laughs> Here's a valuable lesson I learned late in my 28th year. Uh, when somebody goes, you gotta see it, you don't actually have to see it. You can do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Those shows are great, but they're an outrageous time commitment. <laughs> an episode of The Wire is an hour long, times 12 episodes, times five seasons. That's like... Well, there's no way of actually knowing how much time that is. <laughs> it was a long time. You could learn something. You can learn how to meditate. That's a thing you can learn. I didn't know that growing up. I'm Irish Catholic. We don't meditate. The closest thing Irish Catholic families have to meditation is just icy silence. <laughs> so I said I had to be born with that shit, but it turns out you can just go to the Y and give a pot at 100 bucks, and it'll teach you how to meditate. Now you know how to do that. You have this awesome new thing. And the next time some smug asshole's like, you haven't seen Game of Thrones? You're like, no, I haven't seen Game of Thrones, but I recently learned how to meditate, and I feel like I'm one with everything. Do you feel like you're one with everything? And he'll be like, no, and you'll be like, yeah, fucking suck my dick. <laughs> he'll say. <laughs> you'll tell him to suck your dick, because you've been meditating, but not long enough that it's had a positive effect on your personality. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Don't think I'm gonna get beat up. That's the goal. <laughs> this is cool. I used to get Joe at List and I, the guy I was on before, we used to get fucked up. He doesn't drink we both stopped drinking. He stopped drinking, he went through like programs. Uh I stopped drinking uh not by choice, which 
fucking blows. Like, if you're going to quit drinking, you have to hit rock bottom. Because otherwise, you just remember it fondly. Yeah. Like, drinking for me is like backpacking across Europe. For the pictures alone, totally worth it. <laughs> like, I wasn't even a dick. Like, the worst thing I ever did is I went to go show, see my buddy's band. Uh, and apparently, I blacked out, uh, during which I whipped out my penis. And I tried to play a xylophone with it. Uh, it didn't make any noise. Which makes me think I have a small dick, because some people measure by length and some people by width, but I go by pitch. <laughs> I forgot about that one. The <laughs> reason I stopped drinking is because I went to a doctor because I thought I had heartburn, but he was like, no, you have diabetes. So I was close, you know? <laughs> like, you ever go to a mechanic and you're like, hey, I think the brake pads are getting thin. He's like, no, actually, the engine fell out about 10 miles ago. <laughs> It's like that, but with an organ. <laughs> so I stayed in the hospital, and that's what he told me. He so said, I can't drink, drink, drink booze. Well, he didn't say that. He told me I had diabetes, and I was like, can I still drink? Which probably shouldn't have been the first question I asked. I probably should have been more like, what is diabetes? <laughs> and so I was like, can I still drink? And he's like, yeah, but you can only have one. And I was like, no deal. <laughs> so I was like, fuck, I can't drink anymore. I gotta figure out some way to get high. Because I'm not just going to live, you know? <laughs> so, so I was trying to figure out how to get high, and he said you can get high from working out, which I now do every day, and uh, that's not even kind of true. <laughs> but I do it, so in a couple of years, I quit drinking, and now I work out every day, and I have friends that are like, I should get diabetes. And I know this messing with me, but there's a logic there, you know? Still, it's going to be a better way to get your shit together. Like, getting diabetes and get your act together would be like becoming a registered sex offender so that you can meet your neighbors. <laughs> Thanks. I used to open with that, but, but I, uh, I stopped doing it because it's not very pandering. Like, if you're a comedian and nobody knows who you are, you gotta, like, say shit to get strangers to like you. You gotta be like, ah, the fucking troops. You know? But it's not like there's... It's not like there's some diabetic pedophile out there that's like, finally, a joke for me! You know? <laughs> there's not a lot of diabetic pedophiles. Because how are you gonna get them in the van if you can't have any candy? You know? <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's my time. Thanks so much, kids. Have a good Let them know. Dan Bolter, everybody. Keep it going for Dan. Bolter. Thank you for coming all the way to Brooklyn, Dan. And thanks for doing the show. One more time for Dan, everybody. One more time for yourselves. You guys are an awesome, awesome crowd. Thank you. This next guy lives in Brooklyn and he's run a show on Sirius XM Radio for the past 10 years, every morning from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, he's a fantastic comedian, a good friend of mine, my best friend and a good comedian, ladies and gentlemen, a great comedian, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the stage, Kenny Zimlinghouse. Number one on iTunes. Number one on iTunes. Oh, wow, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I was like, if he doesn't say best friend, I'm getting the fuck out of here. I'm his best friend. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than me. I'm the best at being Greg's friend. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Thanks for being here. Today I found out what the worst moment of my life was. I sat down, I thought about it. I figured it out. My parents can't find parking. Uh, worst moment of my life. I was uh, 12 years old, fat kid, I was uh, pretty much completely naked, I had socks on, I was sitting at the end of my bed discovering my body. That's a euphemism, but I was discovering it with nothing but socks on and I made eye contact with myself in a full length mirror. Was, that was pretty tough, you know. Uh, the worst part about it wasn't that I looked at myself and saw what it was, but it was the, and the hand that I wasn't using to explore myself. I was still wearing the Nintendo Power Glove. It was a tough moment for me. 
I was walking around today, I saw a sign that uh, passed the construction site and said, hey, if you uh, want to report unsafe work conditions, anonymously call 311. I was like, what, what nerd is going to call 311 and report unsafe work conditions anonymously, you know? What kind of try hard person does that just calls up hey three i'm at the 21st street construction site and this guy's working without his helmet on i'm a fucking hero but what's your name no 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 i don't want to bring my family into this like spider-man you try too hard if you call and report unsafe work conditions i feel like i try too hard when i run for a train like i'm gonna miss it and then it stays at the station for three more minutes you feel like a hero when you get on that train, you're like, Phew, ah, yeah, I made it. <laughs> Conductor's like, uh, we're going to be healthier for a few more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. I feel love when I try too hard. I'm scared, I'm scared of everything. I walk around terrified of everything. I don't know if you guys get scared, I get, I'm a jumper. People sneeze, I jump. I'm not used to it. It pulls me out of my thought, makes me freak out when people sneeze in public or something. You know, you ever walk past the bus, and the, right when you walk past it, the bus is just like, Tsh! and it lets out that air noise, right? I, I scream every time that. To be, to be pulled from complete placidity and calmness to that is, that's terrifying. We shouldn't have to go through that. Every time I walk past the bus, it's like, I literally jump. Like, yeah, thanks, bus. Thank you for that. Bus queef. <laughs> okay. Or there's construction work and they just they drop steel for a living. That's all they do. That's terrifying. I, mean, I can't handle walking around this city because I feel like I'm pretty innocent and I'm pretty calm and quiet. But anytime a guy drops steel next to my face, I run. Like it's the scariest thing I've ever heard. I'm terrified. I'm afraid of snipers. You ever walk around normally? <laughs> Being afraid of snipers when they're in the news, you ever zigzag? There was a time in my life for like three months, I was zigzagging everywhere I went. At my wedding, I zigzagged out of the aisle. I was terrified of snipers and tsunamis. It's tough to be afraid of everything. My dog doesn't understand how sensitive I am, you know? If I'm in the bathroom or something, which is being a married man, you're in the bathroom, that's the time of being calm, you know? It's a time to catch up with yourself. Whether you're using the bathroom or not, I know my wife's not gonna come in, it's fine. And it's the dog that doesn't understand these levels of intimacy, you know, because I'll be in the bathroom, it'll be really quiet, real nice, I'll be re reading or whatever. The dog will bust open the door like she's on a drug raid. I don't know if you have a dog, I don't have a dog in here. Does that, yeah, this dog does not understand. I'll be like, this is nice, though. And I'm like, whoa, and she, I'm like, leave, leave. She's like, what's going on in here? I'm like, nothing, nothing. She's like, no, I'm gonna lay on your ankles and be a part of this shit like you're in a sit-up contest in third grade. <laughs> That's a lot of intimacy I've had to learn through being married, you know? I used to live alone, now I have a dog holding my ankles while I take shits. It's <laughs> a lot of intimacy. You found out the hard way that StubHub.com is not a dating website for amputee girls. <laughs> it's for tickets. Bodies are miracles, right? Talking about being afraid. You ever wake up in the middle of the night with a Charlie horse? What a fun name for what that is, Charlie horse. Sounds like a kid's ride, you know, but it's a terrifying thing. Talk about going from calm to being scared. 3 a.m., you wake up and you're like, ah, yeah, my toes are supposed to do that. Yeah, thanks, God. <laughs> terrifying, terrifying things. Bodies are miracles. You ever sneeze and fart at the same time? It's a miracle. <laughs> what is that? What two, two opposite ends of your body going to the same? That's a slip in the matrix, right? You feel a sneeze coming out. It's totally fine to sneeze in public. You're like, <laughs> which, by the way, that feeling, that flux that you're in between sneezing and not sneezing, I think that's what hell is. I think if you get to hell, it's permanently like <laughs> forever, you know. And there's a douchebag friend. It's like God bless you, 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 God bless you. Like, I didn't fucking sneeze at you, ruining it. The right the last second, something your whole body goes horribly wrong. <laughs> you freeze, you know. You start checking yourself for new holes because your body just rebooted. 
<laughs> Sneeze fart is like God's control alt delete. <laughs> you suck your body. You guys look good. You guys are good looking crumb intimidated. So yeah, I don't have a lot of body shame. You know, I grew up a fat kid and I have body shame. I don't even like to eat in public. People love eating in public now. They don't care about it. They walk behind the guy here walking today, drinking a Dr. Pepper. Do drinking a Dr. Pepper in public. <laughs> That's so much confidence. I've I, been I, nine years, I can't drink a cherry soda. I don't have that confidence. People eat chicken parmesan heroes on the subway. That's so crazy to me. You're eating chicken parmesan on the subway. You know what kind of environment I need to eat chicken parmesan? It needs to be 4 a.m. I need to be in a closet, a locked closet from both ends. And everybody else in the world has to be under anesthesia. For me to really go at a chicken parmesan. Things are changing, times are changing, everything's moving so fast, I don't like it, it scares me, I can't keep up with it, everything is just so fast. National Geographic now refers to themselves as Net Geo. Too much change for me. National Geographic used to be so fucking, like, legitimate. Now they're like, what's up, Nat Geo? Like, Nat Geo is the kid that you save the soda pop tops for to save his kidney when he's died and you're in middle school. Nat Geo. Everything went to hell when Nestle's Quick changed their name to Nesquik. <laughs> right? It was just quick. It was my favorite thing. Now that they throw the company on Nesquik. Fuck that. That's so crazy. That's so much corporation, you know? Everything changes so fast. The marketing for shit is so insane. Why are we still making and selling new ski masks? <laughs> what skier wears a ski mask, right? They're for murderers. <laughs> No skier wears a ski mask. You're skiing and you ski past someone with a ski mask. They just killed somebody at the top of the mountain. And they're skiing to get the fuck away. I can't believe people are still buying the Craftmatic adjustable bed. That thing's like six thousand dollars. Like buy a pillow or sit up. You don't need an engine in your bed to do that, right? You need like a back muscle. A little bit of the will to live. <laughs> See that sleeping aid pill commercial for Lunesta, where people are lying wide awake at 3 a.m. in their bed and they, and they can't fall asleep, and through their screenless window, this giant glowing green butterfly comes in and hovers above their chest, and they quickly fall asleep, like, ah, oh, thank God you're here, Lunesta butterfly. Don't you feel like this is the last thing on earth that ever helped you fall asleep at 3 a.m. was a giant glowing green butterfly hovering above your heart? Because we don't have those on earth. We don't live on fucking Pandora. <laughs> I'd run out and put a screen on my window to keep out the radioactive insect. <laughs> The commercials for gum, you ever see those commercials for five gum? Or they're like, hey, what does it taste like to have five gum? And it's people in like a death chamber strapped down and it rains glass on them and it's like, Psh, gum. It's gum. That, it's gum. It used to be free. Now people are like, you want, to, you want to try some gum? You're wearing all leather with a fucking ball gag on. They're shoving gum. They're like, yeah, five gum. Fuck you. Marketing has gotten insane. M&M's have personality now. M &M, you can buy m and That's the way they market it to us. They run away on the conveyor belt. They're like, ah, you can't eat me. Fuck you. Get in the ball. You get in the ball. And we're like, yeah, we're going to eat the shit out of that. We give all this food personality, you know. Cinnamon Toast Crunch commercials now have all the Cinnamon Toast Crunch swimming around in the bowl of milk like it's a spa. They're so happy. One of the Cinnamon Toast Crunch slides down the spoon like it's a slide in the air. Another Cinnamon Toast Crunch comes up and eats him in mid slide. And that's it for the commercial. They're like, yeah, buy Cinnamon Toast Crunch. And people are like, yeah, I'm going to eat the shit out of that life. It's just the marketing that has gotten insane. <sighs> the news is insane, too. You can't pay attention to anything anymore. Everything is so crazy. CNN, recently, CNNonline.com had this headline that read, Incest Dungeon Girl, what's next? Incest Dungeon Girl, what's next? 
And the story was about this girl who, for the first 14 years of her life, her father locked her inside a homemade basement, did terrible things, and after 14 years, he confessed, and now she's free to go. And CNNOnline.com was like, how will Incest Dungeon Girl ever reemerge into society? Will society accept Incest Dungeon Girl? And I was kind of thinking, CNNOnline.com, we could throw her a bone here and stop calling her Incest Dungeon Girl. Right? That'd be a start towards reemergence, right? If a day one she's free and everyone's like, ladies and gentlemen, the world, please welcome Incest Dungeon Girl! And she's a professional wrestler. <laughs> Too much. They had CNN, the network, had these two political commentators on talking back and forth. One of them said to the other one, never before in my wildest dreams did I think I would see such negative ad campaign against Barack Obama. Never before in my wildest dreams. I was kind of thinking, that's not so much of a wildest dream to me, you know? Like, usually my wildest dreams, all my teeth break off my mouth and I'm chewing them like chiclets. <laughs> Sometimes in my wildest dreams, my penis falls off and rolls underneath the stove and I can't find it for the remainder of the wildest dream. You ever have this dream, guys, where you're like, oh, I guess I don't have a dick. I gotta fly, but you're totally cool. You're like, oh, where the hell? Oh, there it is. It's underneath my family's first stove. Why is my third grade teacher here with an alligator? Get me back my dick. That's wild, you know? Sometimes in my wildest dreams, I'm in a limousine without a driver, about to crash into a pool. Driver's on the side of the road chewing my penis like a chicklet. Those are wild dreams, you know? I've never woken up at 3 a.m. in the cold sweat and been like, ah, 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 I just had the most wildest dream. It was mudslinging against President Barack Obama. How will I ever get to sleep? And I thought, it's like, oh yeah, Lunesta Butterfly, yeah. Thank God you're here. Thank you for laughing and stopping right away. We have a lot of work to do tonight. I appreciate you not letting your laughter get in the way. <laughs> I travel a lot doing shows. I don't like traveling. Uh, I think traveling's gotten really annoying. You give away a lot of your personal freedoms. I drive a lot to Canada to do shows. We cross the border in Canada, a lot of comedians are like, hey, don't tell them you're working, tell them that you're there for fun, or else they're not going to let you in uh, because of tax purposes and whatnot. So inevitably, you got to answer the questions from the customs guy who's like six feet above you on an elevated platform. And he asks a bunch of questions, and every time he always asks this question, are you traveling to Canada for business or pleasure? And I always find this weird moment in my life that to look this man in the eye and lie be like, pleasure. <laughs> Yes, pleasure. Because I don't say I do anything in my life for pleasure. I don't smoke Newports or anything. But I look this Canadian mountain and be like, pleasure. Three days of Canadian pleasure. I'm such a pleasure fan. <laughs> travel through TSA at the airport. That's a whole bunch of freedoms that we give up. You know, you take your belt off and your shoes off. It's so naked for me to be in public. I have body shame. I told to take my belt off and my shoes off around people. I feel so vulnerable and so exposed. You know, I'm dirty about my belt and my shoes. And inevitably, you get through security and I pass through. And every time I put my belt back on, I make eye contact with some kid. <laughs> I feel so dirty. I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I was just back there plowing your mom. <laughs> I'm just naked with your family, kid. That's my time, everybody. Thanks for coming out to Splitting. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Everybody, keep it going for Kenny Zindling House. Kenny, thanks for doing the show, Kenny. Let them know, everybody. Let them know. Let them know. The backyard, come and go as you please. Everything's fun. I tweet people a lot to ask them if they'll come do this show. We're all adults, right? We all know what Twitter is. I mean, of course, that's a stupid thing to say. I tweet people. I said uh, I tweeted Spike Lee and asked him if he'd come to do the show. Cause who wouldn't want to see Spike Lee up here? I'm like, hey, uh, at Spike Lee, would you come and do my show in Brooklyn this Thursday night and do stand-up? And he wrote back. He wrote, no, sir. <laughs> Does he know he doesn't have to reply? I tweeted, uh, Lisa Loeb. <laughs> Is she here? 
No, she's not here. I tweeted Lisa Loeb. Hey, Lisa, come by the Brooklyn show and come do stand-up, please, this Thursday. And she wrote back. So she wrote me back, too. She wrote, sorry, I'm in L.A. and I don't do stand-up. <laughs> uh, this next comedian is great. We're always lucky to have her here at the Brooklyn show. She hails all the way from Canada, but she lives here in Brooklyn now because this is the planet, right? Brooklyn is the best. Please. Give a big round of applause for your next comedian, very funny. Ladies and gentlemen, get loud if you would. Yeah. Sabrina Jalice is here. Yeah. Sabrina, I love you, babe. Sabrina, give it up for Sabrina, everybody. Make, let her know. Let her know. Is it? It's all copyright free? Who's the artist? Just some low confidence artist that's like, no, who would buy it? <laughs> no one would buy this shit. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, hails from Canada. Hailing is a weird way to put anything, you know? Hailing with, uh, just came down with the frozen rain, and here I is. Here I is! Hailing! Yeah. Woo! You going to America? You know? But, uh, that is what I did. I did. I left Canada and said, this is probably a better bet for me. Yeah, you guys, this is the thing, like, America's like the rich friend, so you feel awkward about your money. So, like, that's like a weird thing to react to, that people are, like, coming to America, but, no, you guys are, but, but the sacrifice is that you've got fucking rich people problems. You've got problems. <laughs> problems! You know, so many of them. Uh, uh, I went to Thailand, and every Thai lady, I wore a top bun the whole time, because who's going to do this in Thailand? No, you can put your hair up. You hold your wife's hand and everyone thinks you're a man as fuck. <laughs> everyone, like prostitutes were soliciting me, like, oh, you boy girl, you, you know, it's so, was so cool. <laughs> it's weird how I accepted it in Thailand, but I was so mad when I landed at LaGuardia, same haircut, uh, top bun, and then this eight year old bitch was looking at me. I didn't like it. She was like, uh, why is there a boy in the girl's bathroom? I'm like, why is there a cunt in this eight-year-old girl? <laughs> Put that there. Why? Why do I accept it from Asian prostitutes but not eight-year-old white girls? Who knows? I think because it's just easier to get mad at whites in gym, you know? It's the year of the, like, fuck the white men, and even white people are in the audience being like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's perfect. Uh, yeah, I, how do I expect you to feel as a community about that? Not obviously laughter, so why am I talking about it? <laughs> you know, this is a process of uh, trial, error, trial. Are you guys good at uh, sex? <laughs> you pretty good at that? Nobody? Put your hands together if you're good at sex. <laughs> All right, so 6% of you <laughs> uh, feel good about the sex you're giving, and I don't judge that. Actually, I judge the people that were like, woo, like, fuck you, you know? <laughs> what do you think you do that we don't do? We all give it our all in the bedroom, because it's what you do! <laughs> but isn't it kind of weird that, like, to get sex, you do the opposite of what it takes to be good at sex? You know, like, to even come, you have to be a fucking animal. You know, like you're not, it's like, not like the human, when you're like, it, that's an animal part of you. <laughs> but to get sex, you're like, ooh, button, sure, cologne, credit card. Like you pretend you're a human, but then to be good at sex, you have to be like, I don't care what shit gets in my mouth. Let it, you know? Uh, is it resonating? Medium. Medium resonations. Okay, let's be real. You can't just ride on charisma, you gotta give the real, honest material to the people. What's your name? Madeline. Madeline? Are you attracted to me? <laughs> Here's the trick about being on stage. I really do picture that a lot of people are attracted to me, but the way Madeline just said Madeline was literally verbatim this. <laughs> Madeline. Like, are we falling in love or what? 
My wife is away this weekend, but you know, obviously I don't take those kinds of risks. You gotta, you know, you make the investment, tap them, you grow the hair, you got the wife. Last time my wife was away though, I went, I buck wild every weekend, drinking unlimited snacks at the bodega. Just so not the fruits either. Bitch. <laughs> what a badass I think I am. Just fucking ice cream. Snickers ice cream bar? Yeah, three of them. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Who's gonna count the rappers now? <laughs> Just my body. <laughs> I want to be skinny, but like, do I really want to? Like, I want to be thin. Like, I feel like being thin is the same thing as having a lot of Twitter followers where it's like, it's not everything, but it's fucking everything. <laughs> and I need it, and I want it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm at this bodega, and this guy comes up to me and is like, it's like four in the morning. He's like, I am sorry, I just, I'm just a huge fan of your comedy. Can you come over and have beers with my friends? And I was like, wait, what? Really? And he was like, yeah, no, I think you're, you are so fucking funny. Just come have a beer. And I'm like such a whore for attention that I'm like, mm. I mean, who cares if you get murdered? You're getting compliments. <laughs> and uh, we, as we're walking into the guy's apartment, uh, the guy's friend's apartment, he opens the door and he goes, seriously, Broad City is my favorite show. <laughs> oh no! That's not me! <laughs> Explain it. Like, I'm such a psycho in that scenario. I'm like, fan of me? Accountant? Nancy from New Jersey? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I was like, he's like, you're not Abby? I'm like, nah, bitch, I'm savvy. <laughs> anyway, they're, I'm friends with them. I'm friends with so many good, famous people. It's the best when your friends get famous because you, <laughs> like, automatically intrinsically exaggerate your relationship, you know? <laughs> We're like, brought like Alana and Abby, friend, 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 Sashir, SNL, cool, friend, friend. But like, as soon as they get their credit, I'm so dramatic, where I'm like, no, I can't go out on Saturday, Sashir's on SNL! It's like, you barely know her, you know? <laughs> okay, that one, a well, little too weird, I think. <sighs> I mean, probably what I want to actually talk about, I don't have that much time. This is Lady Kelly Kowoko, who's an actress on The Big Bang Theory. And I know we're in New York, generally, like people here don't watch it. In the rest of the world, The Big Bang Theory is people like, my Big Bang! You know, they really, really like it. Delicious. <laughs> That's the thing about New York, it makes you kind of an asshole, where you go and see the things that people, other people in other cities like. You have to be like, oh, is this your local haunt? <laughs> but in your mind, you're like, your life is the worst. <laughs> uh, the Big Bang Theory, really resonating with America and internationally. Uh, and this lady, Kelly Kowoko, who's an actress in the show, she did, did an interview and she was like, uh, I am not a feminist. Here's the thing, I just, I love raising my kids and being a housewife. It's like, bitch, that's unrelated. What are you fucking talking about? You can do both, Kuoko. You loco. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, what the fuck kind of movement are you trying to start, you dumb bitch? Like, be <laughs> seriously. No, but seriously, like, being a feminist means you believe men and women are of equal value. That's it. That's it. So saying you're not a fan, that's like being like, world peace, I mean, I would be for it, I would, I just, I love pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously the problem is that there's like a, an issue with branding and feminism, where like, with Facebook and shit, there's people that are fucking with the brand, you know, they're like being like, as a feminist, don't look at me, don't talk to me, don't open a door. Bitch, get off our brand. We've got real shit that we're talking, like we've got real fucking, as a brand we have to be united, like what do we really want? What do we want to not get raped, you know? When do we want it? Pretty fucking soon. No one took that risk tonight. Yeah, 
and that hit, and who knows why. <laughs> As I was saying it, I was like, get the fuck out of your body and don't continue the sentence. But it hit harder than jokes that I had crafted, you know? So that's something to remember the comedy. I literally, I mean, I've had like a flirtation and connected with a woman that is not my wife. My wife is literally away. <laughs> and uh, it's a real conundrum in terms of a situation of just how to deal with looking at you, you know, like ever since that I said my wife and then you were like, book a coke to your friend. Ever since then, I'm like, if I look at her, I will ruin my marriage. But really, I'm never going to leave my wife. But what is, you know, life is a horrible place sometimes. <laughs> a horrible, weird place. I mean, because we're, toge we're together forever. That's the thing. My wife and I are together forever. Oh, I'm such a nerd. Why can't we all just be cooler? I want to have a kid. I, we can't have a kid that looks the same as the two of us. That's not what I wanted. Obviously, it's what I knew when I was... Uh, realized, oh shit, this feels more better to be with women. It was like, riddle sticks, no sperm. <laughs> riddle dicks. <laughs> That's the worst part about being gay, really, is like, the only way to make a baby looks half like me, half like my wife, I need my brother's sperm. <laughs> the worst thing anyone said tonight. <laughs> Not to put in me, obviously. Some idiot came up to me after a show, she was like, I, you can't put that inside you. I'm like, no shit, Amelia Bedelia. <laughs> Obviously, I want my wife to do a handstand, I do a layup, just <laughs> Baby. <laughs> Even you, gayest move in the WNBA. Anyway, I asked him for a super cash. I was like, how's your day? Can I have a dollop of your jizz? <laughs> And his real response was, I just don't know how my future wife would feel about it. I'm like, I don't know how I feel about your future wife being a cunt. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>